All right. So now we, we, we go to the important people of our meetup, um, Andrew and Mike. So, uh, um, Mike, since you're on mute first, Loan, you start. We'll tell them, everyone a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, yeah, Mike Gertaboy, um, up here in the Seattle area. Um, we, um, I work for a company called JS Coast Capital. Um, we do mortgage banking um, all over the country. Um, and uh, we're a smaller shop. Uh, we're about 10 people total. Um, and uh, and half, half of it kind of deals with the servicing kind of aspect of it. Half of it uh, deals production. Um, about 50% uh, of what we do is life insurance business um, where we originate and we service the debt, um, lend on behalf of these life codes um, that we've been doing that for the last 30, 40 years at shop. Um, and then the other kind of aspect of it is, you know, kind of where we, we do more brokerage um, operations where we, um, you know, do a lot of debt fund deals. That's kind of where we find most of our construction bridge um, and uh, those types of products, products that don't really fit into the life company buckets or sometimes, you know, there's more competitive options available um, like Fannie Freddie, uh, for example, uh, where we would fund, fund that, those deals for that as well. Great. And then Andrew, you want to uh, tell them about, about yourself as well. And then you have a, uh, you could share that document too, if you want to. Sure. Why don't I throw it up on the, uh, it says I'm, I'm disabled from screen sharing. There you go. It should work. Yeah. Uh, it looks like you've disabled participant screen sharing. So um, no big deal. I'll just, uh, I'll go into it. We can circulate it after the fact. Uh, um, I like it. Okay. How about now? Perfect. Uh, let's see here. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, my name is Andrew Wessling with Walker and Dunlop. I'm based in Los Angeles. Uh, Walker and Dunlop is a national commercial real estate finance and investment sales firm. Um, we operate really with three different hats on the capital market side. We are a direct lender for all things multifamily across the country. Uh, we also are a mortgage banking firm for uh, originating and servicing life insurance company debt like Mike. And then we, uh, the third hat we wear is similar to Mike's. We are a, uh, a broker of third party uh, debt fund, bank, credit union, uh, and other sources of capital, private investors, et cetera. Um, as a company, really our wheelhouse and our bread and butter though is multifamily finance. As you'll see, um, in 2019, we did about 32 billion in transactions. 87% uh, of that 32 billion was multifamily finance or investment sales. Um, so we have a, a big experience in that. Um, the majority of those multifamily financings are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and HUD. We are a Fannie Mae dust lender, a Freddie Mac seller servicer, uh, and a HUD correspondent. So we are the direct underwriter and lender for those pieces. There's no intermediary on that. Um, we have 40 offices nationwide. Uh, as of yesterday, we've opened 24 of them with the remainder hopefully opening the rest uh, later this month. Um, our firm, we're approaching about a thousand employees, so we're fairly small compared to some of our global competitors like CBRE and JLL, and yet we have Fannie Mae's largest market share. And so on the execution front, we believe that we are probably um, the best multifamily lender for agency execution in the country. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. So um, why don't we jump in? Why don't tell everyone what a debt fund is, because I'm not sure everyone knows that. Oh, should I start there? All right. Uh, so a debt fund is, um, I mean, it's a, Kind of, uh, it's a typically it's a balance sheet lender. Uh, they have a bucket of capital, kind of like an investment fund, um, and they invest in debt. So they um, they see their their space to be, you know, kind of kind of on the debt side. But in a lot of these kind of groups, they also invest in uh, mezzanine. They'll also um, invest in uh, prep equity pieces. But, um, but kind of the most, um, I, I think, important thing is uh, they typically deal with, uh, 
bridge, bridge lending and construction lending. Um, you know, where they don't, their price intensity a little bit too high for the uh, balance, or sorry, for the perm lending side. All right. And Andrew, why don't you explain uh, LifeCo lending is, because I, I think a lot of people have heard Agency Dad, Fannie and Freddie, but they don't fully understand what uh, LifeCo is. Sure. So life insurance companies, um, just like all other commercial real estate lenders, are out there putting first trust deeds on commercial real estate. Um, typically across all asset classes. And the way that they fund those loans is um, essentially, uh, it depends on the products that they're selling on the insurance side. And so what we see is there are insurance companies out there that are doing disability insurance, that you'd go and buy disability insurance for yourself or your wife. Um, and those are typically shorter term policies. And then there's firms like Northwestern Mutual and some other uh, mutual companies that are doing whole life insurance, which you've probably heard of. So if I go buy a whole life insurance, um, I'm paying premiums to that insurance company for 30, 40, 50 years because it's for my entire life. What they do is that life insurance then uh, company turns around, takes those premiums that they've come in, that they're getting from me, the consumer, and they're investing those across many different asset classes. They're buying corporate bonds. They're buying, um, you know, you name it. But one of the pieces where they'll invest is commercial real estate debt. And so typically we see life insurance companies putting maybe 20% of their investments out into commercial real estate debt. And the beauty of it is depending on uh, the, the, the asset and the, the quality they can offer terms that commercial banks and the agency lenders like Fannie and Freddie cannot because they're typically matching their assets to their liabilities. And so if you have a whole life asset in my policy that I'm paying to the life insurance company, they can turn around and give you a 30 year fixed rate loan because they know that I'm going to be paying my policy for those 30 years. So the interesting part is their cost of capital traditionally can be very competitive on the short side, but they can also go very long term on the fixed side because they have the ability to do so where not a lot of the competition does. Great. And if anyone has questions, you know, feel free to put in the chat as we're going along. You don't need to wait to the end or anything. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. I see that Greg has a question here. Um, is mezzanine debt like bridge loans uh, slash shorter term loans? Um, well, not so it, it can be, but typically mezzanine debt is secured by the equity interest uh, rather than the um, than the uh, the deed. So, and, and when I say that, what that means is that, um, for example, if um, you know things go wrong, um, and as a property owner, uh, as a sponsor, not able to make payments, um, the the perm lender, it would be the one that's getting their, um, the senior lender is the one that's going to be getting the payments first. Um, and if this, uh, if the mezzanine lender um, forecloses, the mezzanine lender uh, becomes the, the, uh, the new sponsor. So they effectively they take over your equity interest and they become the borrower. Um, and then, and then that's, that's the difference. Um, so usually um, the, yeah, the rates are higher because they have a little bit more risk. Uh, in the deal because, um, you know, let's say, you know, uh, you, you have a 50% uh, loan to value loan um, and you, you know, you have a mezzanine position that get, takes you up to 80. Um, if the property value, let's say, goes down to 50% for any, you know, for any reason, um, you know, the mezzanine piece is the one that would get wiped out while the senior piece uh, lender would not feel anything. <laughs> so. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, um, typically we see MES or preferred equity positions, yeah, I kind of use those interchangeably, um, be coterminous with the senior loan. So it really depends on what the business plan is for that property. If you are a value add play, that's a three to five year hold, uh, typically your, your MES or your PREF is gonna be identical to that, expecting to be paid off when you either refinance or you sell that asset at the end of the term. But if we do an agency execution, like a Freddie Mac fixed rate loan, there are some you know, related companies who we have a great relationship with, will do a preferred equity position that matches that seven or 10 year fixed rate loan. 
Um, so there's the opportunity to potentially go. It, do, it doesn't have to be a short-term type loan, but typically it's going to be coterminous with the senior loan that it's accompanying with. Well, you know, let's jump into the current state of lending. You know, that's what everyone everyone's talking about. And when I say current state, I know it changes from day to day and week to week. I mean, it's 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 crazy. So, you know, what do you what are you guys seeing out there? What are the lending requirements? Um, uh, let's let's dive into this. Um, unpack this huge topic. Sure. All right. Um, so, I mean, what we're seeing across the board um is well the agencies are going strong right there <laughs> they're uh, um, they're offering record low rates uh rates that the that really never been offered before um definitely kind of pushing the balance there um in in the life company side um rates are coming down they're starting to approach kind of where they were pre-covid but uh life insurance uh companies tend to be a little bit more um conservative uh, in terms of lending so they're you know they're trying to trying not to go too far low and plus they they have competing factors with the um, corporate bond market so if the corporate bonds are um, you know they're getting more returns there they, they can reallocate some of their um, investments right in which case and um, you know they'll just they just won't you know they're they're not not, they're not currently doing as much, I think, in the multifamily space, especially on deals where um, Fannie and Freddie are, um, you know, big players in currently. Um, and then, yeah, debt funds, uh, you know, they're pulling back out a little bit more out of construction just because um, there's, uh, <laughs> for, for the debt funds, a lot of their kind of funding, mechanism, uh, funding mechanisms kind of dried out a little bit uh, where you have, um, you know, so these debt funds, they, they get capital for different places. A lot of them have balance sheets, right? They have uh, money that they raise for investors. Um, some of it, some of it, they leverage through warehouse lines, which is a loan on kind of their, their whole book, uh, that they'll lend out. Um, and then some of them, they have, you know, more bigger shops like colony, they'll have repo operations where they, you know, they put up some assets and are able to get some liquidity there, which they could in turn lend out. And then um, some have, you know, UCLOs, um, which is kind of like CMBS, but they could tranche out some of their, their pools. But anyway, um, the, you know, the, the matter is uh, repos, they're affected by mark to markets. Um, so, you know, they, <laughs> they're they lenders that have been using that to, um, to, to have more liquidity in their balance sheet. They are not doing that as well. Um, they don't have as much money to lend out. Um, CLOs are shut down um, at, at the moment. Uh, not nothing's no CLOs are getting issued. So there's that kind of source gets dry. Warehouse lines, uh, a lot of these bigger banks that kind of offer them, life insurance companies, they got a little bit more conservative, so they pull back. So what you kind of end up having is, um, you know, the, so a lot more balance sheet guys, which traditionally were a little bit more expensive just because they couldn't. Have, they didn't. They didn't use utilize a cheaper uh, source of capital. They are. Um, they're doing a lot more bridge lending now, just because they're able to chase after deals which they uh, weren't able to do so prior to uh, prior to this uh, prior to COVID nineteen. Um, CMBS. Uh, CMBS is uh, is currently coming back. Uh, the pricing is coming down. It seems like every every week. Um, it's hard to predict just because it's the most volatile of all kind of, uh, lending, uh, lenders. And so right now they're, uh, they're not really quoting a spread <laughs> and you can't really lock the rate. So you're uh, essentially going through a process, not knowing what's going to, what you're, where you're going to end up with at the end of the day, right? It could be anything. Mike, um, can you tell the group what the difference between agency debt and CMBS is just for the people that don't know? Oh, uh, wait, so, sorry, repeat that CMBS and what? Uh, agency. Oh, agency. Yeah. So CMBS, I mean, so there is, you know, actually there's, you know, agency CMBS as well, but CMBS uh, typically um, it's in uh, a lot of these groups that do it, you know, there'll be like the Barclays, uh, you know, kind of the Bank of America's the world. Uh, what they do is they make these loans. Uh, they're called uh, syndicate loans where they, um, they make them, they sell into a pool and then they, the pool issues bonds to different investors. Um, you know, ranging from AAA to, um, to effectively junk bonds, right? And the aggregate of it 
um, in, is the um, kind of the break even rate, which is what, uh, and then the, and, and effectively what you get as a borrower is a break even rate plus whatever um, costs were incurred by the, uh, and profitability of the uh, issuer. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. And Andrew, are you seeing anything differently? And what are the lending requirements? I know they've they've softened uh, the you know that a little bit of late. Yeah, you know, I'm just looking at the chat. You know, someone's asking if there's sort of a short document about the types of loans. So I'm going to share my screen again, just so you have this. I want to note though, this this was I put this together pre-COVID. So there are some pieces in here uh, that may not take uh, COVID into account. So I just want to make sure that's clear, we can chat about the differences and what we've seen in, in, you know, underwriting requirements and maybe some additional reserve requirements. But let me throw this up on the screen just so people have the benefit of it. And again, I'll sh I can share all this with everyone if they reach out to me after the fact. It's probably hard to see because there's a lot. These again are just Walker and Dunlop as, as we considered our, our, ourselves a direct lender across these um, points. But again, Fannie and Freddie, which are agencies, HUD, which is uh, really a, a, a government agency, uh, Conduit, which we've actually put on hold. We, we were doing some Conduit um, over the last few years, but we've also gotten out of that business and then the life insurance company. But, um, you know, it's such a loaded question and it's such an interesting question because like you said, it's moving every single day. Um, I was on a panel probably two months ago, something like that, uh, talking about multifamily lending. And at the time we were saying that CMBS was fully out of the market. Uh, there was no one in the business quoting new deals uh, on a securitized platform. And I was posed a question and, and my thought process was, I didn't think that CMBS would be back into the market quoting new deals until later this summer. I think I said July or August. So um, they're back earlier than I thought, which is encouraging. Um, and what that tells me is that commercial real estate is still an attractive place to find yield and for lenders to get yield and that transactions are happening across the board. And even though CMBS had a blip and they were out of the market for a bit, um, I'd say that otherwise, uh, the majority of lenders stayed in business and have continued to do track transactions despite uh, you know, us learning now that we were going into a recession in February and uh, COVID hitting the US really hard in late March and beyond. And so let, let's just talk multifamily underwriting requirements um, for fixed rate permanent debt. We can talk about floating rate value add bridge debt um, after, but let's just look at fixed rate multifamily loan programs. These are for stabilized seasoned properties that you'd be buying, call it you know anything five units and above that is fully leased. Um, the minimum debt service requirement ratio that you're going to find typically across the board today is a 1.25. And you can get that from um, local banks, life insurance companies, and the agencies. Um, now, as you ratchet up the debt service ratio coverage, meaning you're bringing your loan to value down and you're putting more equity into deals, the more favorable the pricing becomes. And so if you, if you just look at that benchmark, typically what you'll find is a max loan to value is going to be 75%. With the agencies, some of them will go to 80%. But in major markets like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Austin, Miami, you're really not uh, regulated by the loan to value metric. It's really your debt service coverage ratio. And for all those out there, essentially what that is, is it's a lender's cushion saying that every dollar of net operating income, I want 125% to $1 that I'll lend you. And so that's where we see mostly the constraint um, for a period of time. And I think even today there is um, some heartburn when it comes to taking cash out refinances, but Lenders, including Fannie Mae, have been very aggressive, even on cash out, really with the only stipulation that they'll want additional principal and interest reserves up front. And then they'll also take taxes and insurance and possibly some rollover reserves up front as well. And, and um, before, when COVID hit, it was about 12 months. Now, it, now it's done about six months, right? 
for the most part? So it varies, <laughs> uh, which is the fun part. Um, so CMBS, just in general, conduit lending, uh, they're at six months of P&I today. Um, Fannie Mae, it will depend on your leverage tier. So Fannie Mae prices in three different tiers. Tier two, which is the highest leverage. Tier three, which is the next uh, ratcheted down. And then tier four, which is your lowest leverage, best pricing. Tier four throughout this entire pandemic still has required zero additional reserves. And so we were doing a ton of business for low levered multis where folks wanted to take some cash out. But at the end of the day, they weren't exceeding 55% LTV or a 155 DSCR cover. So these are very conservative, you know, well-maintained, good assets, uh, well-run with a ton of equity in them. And so Fannie Mae rewarded all those borrowers and said, you don't need to give us any additional reserves. Once you go up into the tier three segment, which is up to 65% LTV or um, no less than a 135 DSCR cover, then you add a six months P&I requirement along with six months of taxes and insurance and rollover reserves. And then once you got up to tier two, which is typically where we were seeing most acquisitions, because of course, at rates where they are, you wanna leverage as much debt as you can. That's where the most stringent um, reserve requirements were being placed. They were 12 months for deals above 6 million and 18 months for deals below 6 million. And so you can imagine on a sub $6 million loan, if you're buying a multifamily property and you have to put up 18 months of principal and interest along with 12 months of taxes and insurance and 12 months of replacement reserves, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And interestingly enough, even if you were taking cash out of an existing asset that you owned and you wanted to get the max leverage and just take all the cash out of the property, Fannie Mae said, we'll do it up to 75% and a 125 cover, but you have to bring the cash to the table for those reserves at closing. We will not net fund it from loan proceeds. So you had to prove that you had enough dough to make the transaction happen to sort of prove it to them, which was really interesting. And what we saw then was a lot of the business that Fannie normally would capture went over to Freddie Mac because they were just less stringent on their reserve requirements. And to this day, they're still doing nine months of P&I, and that's it. Wow, 18 months. That's, that's brutal. It really is. It re what it did is it really rewarded borrowers that hadn't cashed out over the last two to three years and had built all their equity and really amortized their principal down because it gave them the flexibility to now maybe take out that cushion if they needed it. And what we really saw was, you know, acquisitions dried up through um, the end of March and really in, through April as most buyers went on the sidelines um, and even a lot of sellers, I think, sort of went on the sidelines just to wait and see what happened. And uh, most of the business that we were doing as a firm were refinances and the majority of those were cash out refinances because borrowers really had two main goals. One was I want a cushion just in case my tenants need rent relief or um, the property doesn't operate as we hoped and be the other side of it are the more optimistic folks that were saying, I want to have cash ready in case there's an opportunity that comes down the pipe and I need cash so I can move on it and make another acquisition right now. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. So Kyle and I, just when COVID hit, we, we had a property like basically under LOI and yeah, the seller took it off the market because he knew it was, you know, we could have been in, in escrow for, for six months while we kind of wait through this. And if, you know, if NOI dropped, um, we're, you know, he's since brought it back on the market, kind of, he's not sure if he's a seller or, or you know, yet, but um, things in the last two weeks, things have started to heat up and we're seeing a lot more properties out there. Uh, prices, you know, everyone's looking for COVID discount prices, but they're just not there yet, you know? You know, I, that, that's a really interesting point. And just to run with this, and Mike, you probably have your own opinion on it, but, you know, we have not seen appraisals come in uh, with, you know, COVID discounts or whatever you want to call it. I mean, when you look at asset classes across the board, clearly the winners versus the losers here have been multifamily and industrial. Um, and, and so I think there was everyone sort of expected 2008 response where there was going to be panic selling. There was going to be folks who 
who really aren't holding on. And that may be true, especially maybe some class C properties where their tenants are struggling. Uh, but really at the top of the market, the A and B properties, we've seen rent collections hold on. Uh, we've seen values hold on. And so sellers' expectations um, are pre-COVID. And I think they're warranted because listen, if I'm a buyer uh, and I, if I'm a, a, a real estate investor and my options are buying a hotel today versus buying multifamily, I think I'm more inclined to buy multifamily. I want to ask one more question along this topic because every you know we've heard so much talk out there about you know all this distressed uh, opportunities coming six months, twelve months down down the road. Wait, wait, wait. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Are you are you seeing that you know come six months there's going to be a whole lot you know flooding the market at just kind of prices or you know it's it's kind of like you know with multifamily years ago and everyone's you know we're sitting on the sidelines since 2014 waiting for the crash and they lost six years of buying opportunity because they were doing that yeah i mean that's uh that's a tough question to answer right <laughs> and if everyone had to answer that question a lot of us would be uh very <laughs> incredibly incredibly wealthy but um but i think you know the answer to that question really depends on um kind of what the government is going to be doing uh, in terms of kind of propping up the economy, subsidizing um, businesses and, you know, how they're going to be able to do that uh, in order in, uh, to keep unemployment low. Um, and, you know, if people are um, unemployed, you know, kind of keeping those uh, kind of payments going so that way uh, they can make the rent payments. <laughs> Right. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing, it, it really depends on, um, you know, kind of what happens with uh, COVID, you know, if there is a second wave, right, and it does result in additional shutdowns, right, then our results could be a little bit different. Um, but, you know, if everything kind of keeps going along the way it's going on now, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is going to be blood a blip, you know, and especially multifamily industrial, um, you know, there's just, uh, you know, nothing really happened. <laughs> Everything just kind of kept going along. And if anything, uh, demand's heated up, right? Because less people have been going to retail stores. They've, people have been going, uh, ordering things online, Amazon, and um, the industrial markets are doing phenomenal, right? And so are, and so is multifamily, you know, for that exact reason, right? Because people still need a place to live. <laughs> yeah, I'll give, I'll give my two cents. I mean, me personally, and also as a firm, Walker and Dunlop, uh, we, you know, we are bullish on multifamily over the long term. Um, if you look at the just the supply and demand requirements of our country and certain markets across the US, there is a net shortfall of housing. And so people need a place to live. Uh, people will continue renting. Uh, my belief is that we were already seeing um, rental growth slow in a lot of markets, um, partly because the economy was just slowing down. And I think this has just accelerated it. And so will it be as fruitful as it been over the last decade? Probably not. Um, but I don't see <clears throat> sellers saying that, um, you know, my property is worth X, X percent less because of COVID. Um, in fact, I see just the opposite. I think they're saying my, my property is worth just as much, if not maybe more desirable um, in certain markets where new supply isn't coming online. And so, um, I, you know, in 12 to 18 months, the, the really hard part for me is where are rates going to be? Because right now they are historically low, as Mike said in the beginning. And so if you're looking at an acquisition and you can get uh, a pre-COVID, what was a good deal, right? Um, or, or a deal that pencils, right now you have the opportunity to leverage that debt. Whereas in 12 to 18 to 24 months, you may not have such an opportunity. Um, so we're, we're telling our clients, listen, if you have a deal in hand, Take it. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. I mean, the delta between your COVID discount and the rates is is your discount, essentially, right? So I do have a question, though. I think traditionally, people, especially when they're first getting started, are taught to go into fixed rate debt because it's safer. With the rates so low right now, what are either one of your guys' opinions on the best bang for your buck with the most flexibility? Is it a floating rate? Is it a hybrid? Um, or is it still fixed rate? So, um, yeah, I'll start, start there. So rate, so in terms of fixed rate, especially, you know, the aging pro, uh, products, right, you're seeing a lot of, um, you're seeing a lot of yield maintenance prepayment penalties, 
Um, and the way those are calculated, right, it's based on the delta between the then uh, matching treasury of that duration of what you have a loan. So if you have seven years left in a loan and it's, you, know, you take your seven year treasury, you take the de delta between the, the interest rate on your loan um, and the, the treasury that matches that duration. So the idea there is, you know, I don't think yield maintenance, uh, when rates are low, yield maintenance penalties aren't actually that bad. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's basically uh, they're they're a lot they're a lot more palatable than you know going from you know seven percent interest rate down to you know two percent interest rate, uh, just because the what you're compensating for is is that delta over that time, right? So um, so I don't I think right now uh, yield maintenance is actually you know fairly fairly palatable um, in terms of floating rate versus fixed rate. Um, the good thing about floating rate is that typically um, you have much more flexibility in the prepay. Um, and a lot of times where you're, you're also able to get more IO out of a floating rate um, than you are to a fixed rate. Um, and I think the floating rate option could make a lot of sense as well, just because you could purchase um, a LIBOR cap or, uh, you know, interest rate cap, I don't, you know, LIBOR might be going away. So I don't know how that, how, how all those, how all that's going to unfold, but the idea here is you could limit your your top side risk of how where what your rate could be, um, and uh, you could effectively price that in. Yeah, I I, I completely agree. Um, you know, the one thing I'd say, uh, especially for new investors, though, is. Um, you know, you got you to gotta know what's available to you. And so depending on the asset that you're buying, if it's a five or six unit uh, multifamily deal, you know, I don't know how many folks out there are doing small floating rate deals. Um, you know, there's probably more banks and even Fannie who are going to say, let's put it on a 10 year fixed. It just makes a lot of sense. It's cookie cutter and we'll do it that way. Uh, but it also depends on the business plan, right? I mean, is this a value add? Uh, and if that's the case and you're going to either refinance or sell at the end of the term, then I completely agree that a floating rate type deal makes a lot of sense because you want that flexibility once you complete your business plan to get out of it. And I know, Gary, that's sort of, I think that's your model, right? Where you go in, you buy an existing B minus property, you put some money into it, you jump the rents, and then you either refinance and hold it or you sell it at a profit. Um, but for, you know, new investors, it's hard for me to say, you know, that's a great model for you because that's a lot of risk. Um, and so that's why I think if I'm, if I'm giving a recommendation to a new investor who's looking really to start out um, and is looking to, to get their feet wet, it's probably buy a stabilized property that you can probably fix up a little bit over time. Uh, but, but based on where rates are today, I'd say you're better off taking a fixed rate deal and just locking it in to protect yourself. Yeah, so you've got bridge, which is the most, you know, I guess, uh, you know, short term risk, you know, high, higher rate, then you've got the, the floating, and then you've got that longer term agency debt. And, uh, and, and maybe I'll, just, I'll caveat one point, you know, we have very sophisticated institutional clients who are taking floating rate debt right now. They're taking seven year floating rate debt from Fannie and Freddie and from life insurance companies and other debt funds because they're bullish on where rates are going to be based on how dovish the Fed has been and how they're saying, listen, where the economy is, rates aren't going anywhere. And so I'm not worried about the volatility or rates going up. I'm willing to take it. And like Mike said, I can get interest only. Maybe I can get a little bit better underwriting, less reserve, something like that. It's going to boost my loan proceeds, either put more cash in my pocket day one or put more cash flow in my pocket over the term. Um, and if things start to get a little dicey, I have that, fle that prepayment flexibility where I could lock in, even if things start to tick up, it's still going to be a great rate today. So you know, again, it, 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 there's more risk to it. Um, and, but that's more of a personal uh, opinion on, on how to position yourself. Is it really more risk if you're able to buy a cap? And from what I've heard, caps are pretty inexpensive right now with the way the rates are. Am I accurate in that? And then also want to hear your thoughts on the hybrid, because I love the hybrid as well, especially for new investors, for people that don't know it. I'll, I'll give a, a short information on it is you can do a, a 20 year, they're all 20 year terms and you can do a seven year fixed and then a floating thereafter. Right. And so that gives you some flexibility as well. Yeah, and, and, and so that was a little bit to my point exactly, um, Kyle, is, is the risk becomes typically on the floaters, their bullet loans, 
And so you have to pay off at the end of the term, no matter where you're at. Whereas a, a hybrid type product and a, a lot of the local banks, specifically in like the LA and Orange County markets, and even down through Phoenix now, um, they're mo almost every loan product that they offer is a hybrid. So even though you're getting a five or a seven or a 10 year fixed, it's a 20 or a 30 year loan product that rolls into an adjustable. So you're not forced to either pay off or refinance at that time, it, you're automatically covered. So I think that's great advice to a new investor is be uh, look at the loan term and there's a difference between your fixed rate initial period and the actual uh, loan term of the loan. And then, um, I mean, let's let's uh, dive in a little bit, you know, uh, about recourse and non-recourse. Um, you know, obviously, with uh, non-recourse, you're not, you know, liable. But there there are some benefits of recourse. Of you know, if you're doing a cost seg and bonus appreciation, and as a, a GP, you're trying to capture that. Maybe if you guys want to dive in a little bit on 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 recourse and non-recourse. Sure. Like you go. Uh, so yeah, in terms of yeah, high level. Um, yeah, I mean with recourse, I just kind of define it. With you know recourse, it's uh, basically you're giving the uh, the lender the, the the right to go after your other assets um, as a source of repayment. Uh, with well, with non recourse, they uh, they are limited to just the asset themselves. So the most they can do is they could just take back the property, right? So that's, that, that's the key difference here. Um, typically in terms of lenders, banks are, they tend to lean more towards recourse lending while um, you know, some, some smaller life codes will, will also require it. But for the most part, life codes, CMBS, um, you know, debt funds, agency, you know, they're non-recourse lenders, right? So they, um, they kind of cap it that way. Uh, with recourse, you, there's benefits, you know, for example, if you have a sizable ba uh, balance sheet, uh, you know, you're able to uh, get a lot more, um, more than you, you might be able to get from non-recourse lenders, right? In terms of, you know, a better rate, you might be able to get more proceeds, um, you know, just because there's just a lot more there um, than just the, than the property. Yeah, that's a great summary. Um, you know, I, I always say non-recourse is better than recourse um, if you can get it. But listen, if you're in a single, I also say consult an attorney too, because if you're, it depends where you're buying and it depends what the laws are. So if you're in California, it's a single action state, you know, make sure that you understand it. Um, you know, some folks say that non you know, is not, does non-recourse really exist in California? Um, and so again, I'm not an attorney. I'm not here to give you that advice, but make sure that you understand the differences and your liability signing any loan document or taking on any liability or obligation. Um, I, I, but that's exactly right. Mike makes some really good points. When you're looking at lenders, um, typically, uh, if you're giving a personal guarantee, they're going to be underwriting a global cash flow, which a lot of you probably are familiar with with banks, where they're not only looking at the property that you're buying, but they're also looking at you as an individual, putting that together to make a stronger case. And with that mitigant or credit enhancement, as we call it, they're willing to offer you potentially better terms, uh, higher leverage because they have you as a backstop, uh, better rates because um, you know potentially they're seeing assets on your balance sheet that they want to capture. Um, and then you have the, the sort of just programmatic non-recourse lenders, which are the agencies and CMBS. Um, there's no real use even, you know, ask, they, they'll never ask for recourse. So they're solely looking at the cash flow of the property. Uh, but that means that you're limited to just that, the cash flow of the property. And so if you're buying a distressed asset, uh, it makes it much more difficult to qualify on those programs potentially because there's not enough cash flow. Um, whereas you'd probably have to go to a bank and say, listen, here's the story behind this distressed cash, cash flow property. Here's my balance sheet that I'm willing to put behind it that I'm signing a uh, personal guarantee on. And they'll, they'll take that chance and they'll roll with you on a, on a project like that, which is, you know, I'm willing to put the time in, put some money into it to make this, take it from distressed to non-distressed, at which point, um, I think you've earned the right then maybe to ask for a non-recourse loan once you've gotten it stabilized. And in fact, Mike, you know, you do a lot of construction lending. What I find from my developer clients is that when they're building a property, uh, they sign full recourse, completion guarantees, 
uh, environmental guarantees, because listen, they understand the risk. That's the risk of doing business as a developer. However, once they're, they've built the property, it's rented, leased, there's seasoning and it's stabilized. At that point, you know, they make a good point that haven't they earned the right maybe to, to have non-recourse financing on that asset post completion. Right. Um, and I was going to actually piggyback off of that as well. Way interesting as well. I just wanted uh, to mention a lot of times when you sign non-recourse, um, actually always when you sign non-recourse or carve outs that kind of go along with it. Um, so those are, um, and they have like a list of, of events that would trigger kind of a recourse event. So basically, you know, if, uh, you know, you committed fraud or something like that, you know, like they, they could still go after you. Um, so that's, so you kind of want to make sure that you go through and, and read them because some of them are a lot more broader than, than others. Um, and where, you know, a lot of times they're like, yeah, we're not recourse. But when you go for the carve outs, you're like, wait, actually, this is, this sounds a lot like recourse, right? I mean, that, <laughs> um, that, that does include a lot. So, um, yeah, so I think Andrew brought up a good point. Yeah, definitely. When you go through that, um, it might make sense to uh, run some of these carve outs through a real estate attorney, right? That looks at a lot of these kind of documents, especially for, for lar larger shops to make sure that they're in line with industry standards. Yeah. You know, just to tie this in with uh, Benny's question, he's saying he invests in the Midwest, um, sort of smaller property types and do you have loan minimums? So I'd say that um, unless it's programmatic like Fannie and Freddie, um, most of the smaller lenders are going to be recourse based lenders. Um, typically they're regional or they're local. And so, um, you know, just, I'll give you an example, just Fannie and Freddie uh, on their conventional product, they like to be at 6 million and above on loan sizes, but on their small balance programs, they like to be um, one and a half million and above. So they will not do a loan below one and a half million dollars. Um, and so at that point, you have potentially some smaller life companies that would entertain it, but the majority of that business is captured by local banks and credit unions and possibly private investors. And the majority of those folks are going to be recourse lenders who know the area, know the geography, um, and are underwriting a full cash flow on both you and the property. Mike, do you agree? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think another kind of the, a key thing to say, you know, for a lot of these like bridge loans, construction loans, and yeah, for smaller loans, and the smaller loans, I think a lot of it is because of the players that kind of play in that space. But um, for the construction and bridge side of things, you guys, you know, kind of looking at it from the lender side uh, perspective is, you know, if they take, you know, the, that property back, there's no cash flow. <laughs> And there's no kind of means to get that cash flow, right? If you're talking about half completed building, you know, there's, there's, not, there's, <laughs> there's not much they could do with it, right? Um, if they took it back. Um, that's why they want to see that recourse just because then they, could, they can capture back a, little, um, some, a lot more of the losses than, than they would be otherwise. But while, when you have a stabilized property, then, you know, if you have a, you know, 50 unit apartment building, well, you know, you have 50 units that you could just run out. Um, so at the end of the day, you're going to get cash flow regardless. And, you know, it's a much different kind of proposition. So that's why, um, yeah, a lot of, uh, the perm products, uh, especially long-term stuff, it's, it typically, um, hinges more towards non-recourse, um, than it does recourse. But, um, I think another point I want to say is a lot of times when re uh, lenders are recourse lenders, they historically, they actually don't really pursue that recourse as often as, um, you know, as they can, because a lot of times it just doesn't make sense for them to do it. It's a, it's a much, it's a much more arduous process for them. And a lot of times it's just not worth it. So. we got a couple of questions here. Let's, uh, let's jump in. All right, we kind of talked about it briefly, um, but um, do you guys have loan products sub 500,000? Because we've got uh, Benny who's invested in the Midwest where, you know, properties are a bit uh, less expensive there. Yeah, so I'll answer that. As a direct lender, we do not. Um, our, again, Fannie's, Fannie and Freddie's minimum are a million and a half in loan size uh, for our correspondent life codes. We have one that will do uh, 500,000 and above, but they, even they like to stay above a million. Um, and so, but I, you know, I just funded a deal in uh, March or April. It was a $325,000 loan. It was an acquisition loan of an eight unit apartment building in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And so again, we were acting as a broker in that capacity. Um, and so that was not our capital, but we were able to secure it. So um, 
you know, we, we do those types of deals. Um, I'm a young guy in this business. And so it's hard to turn down, um, you know, loan requests, especially for, for clients and referrals. And so, you know, I, 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 we did that deal and then we just got engaged on a $120 million deal on a, uh, an asset in Santa Monica. And so, you know, there's no, I would say there's no real minimum and no real maximum, but it does, it will dictate what kind of lenders are available to you and what capacity, you know, my firm or Mike's firm works with you. And Mike, do you have uh, products under 500,000? Yeah. Um, so we have one life insurance, actually we have two life insurance companies that would, would entertain that. Um, actually three, <laughs> I just got to think about it. One of them, I think is, it would be a little bit pricey. So I don't know how much sense it would make, but, um, but yeah, we have a few life insurance companies or correspondents that would do deals about that small. Um, otherwise, yeah, you, I mean, your, your banks, your credit unions, those are, those are the lenders that typically do, do the deals that small. Right. And we'll share their contact information uh, uh, after we finish. So, you know, feel free, uh, you guys, to reach out to Andrew and Mike and, and, uh, and uh, get some loans from them. Um, are you guys licensed uh, to issue loans in Idaho? You guys are licensed throughout the U.S., correct? Um, yeah, we, we do. Actually, one of our guys uh, in our office, he, they fly down to Idaho uh, once a month uh, to, to, to go down there just because there's, um, you know, it's very close. Um, and not many people, uh, do what we do. Uh, they're based in Idaho. I think there's only a couple and they're, they, you know, nobody has, you know, that we know of at least there has any life insurance money. So, um, even those kind of guys that do what we do, um, you know, kind of mortgage brokers, uh, they, they call us, uh, just because we have, um, access to that capital. Um, but yeah, no, we, we do uh, a bit, quite a bit of business in Idaho, for sure. And, and we're the same, uh, you know, Mike and I overlap a little bit, but uh, on the agency side, Fannie and Freddie and HUD, they are in all 50 states. So as long as you're within the contiguous U.S. or Alaska and Hawaii, um, game on. I think we're... I think one more question, but I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but they're asking, what do you guys think the real estate market prices are going to be like? They're asking specifically LA, but I'm also curious just nationwide based on your experience and what you've seen in the lending market and the whole real estate market for that matter. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, I think I, I answered a little bit earlier, um, but I think it, it really depends on where uh, certain things kind of play out. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, markets where, I mean, I think in particular, if you're thinking about multifamily, I think markets where you have a very stable kind of employment base kind of, I mean, here, I, I think is a good example, like where I live in Bellevue, right? You have Amazon that's bringing in 10,000 jobs, you know, right in, a, in like a six block uh, neighborhood. Um, and they are, you know, that that's a very solid kind of driver, right? So that's that's a driver that's not impacted by COVID as much. That that is a um, company that's seeing record high prices uh, for their stocks. So um, it's a company that's growing. Um, so you know, for example, do a, no matter what kind of the situation happens, I think you know that multifamily market, um, you know, in Bellevue, for example, it's it's going to be absolutely fine, right? Because you have so many um, solid, you know, employers that that aren't impacted by COVID. Um, but that being said, I mean, it really depends. I mean, if you kind of keep going at this pace, um, which I think generally, I think the market scene is positive, right? Stock market scene is positive. I think, um, you know, if, as long as there's no relapses in terms of COVID um, and, um, you know, as long as the government keeps doing their thing and uh, supporting, uh, propping up the economy, um, and helping, um, help helping people. I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, if anything, prices are going to get better. Um, especially, you know, since while government's going to be propping up the economy, then, you know, interest rates are going to stay low. So, um, I think, you know, you're going to, investors are going to see a lot of value come from, from the debt side. Yeah, my take is, um, I guess I'll talk to LA and, and also more generally, um, you know, similar to Mike and, and similar how I invest um, with my wife and I just personally is we follow job growth and employment growth because that typically dictates population growth uh, and where people need to live. 
And then I just keep my tabs on new supply to make sure that a market's not being over, um, overflowing with, with new product coming online. So there's still a, just a fundamental supply and demand. Um, from a fundamental supply and demand side, Los Angeles is underhoused. Um, and we continue to need more multifamily housing. So I think it's a good asset class. I think people will continue to invest in it here. Um, that said, I think rent growth was already slowing. And I think over the next 12 to 24 months, we'll see it continue to slow um, as people just deal with COVID and job loss and other pieces. And so if rental growth slows, um, we all know expenses don't go down. And so your NOI will slowly erode. And if your NOI is lower than it was last year, even if you're at the same cap rate, values technically are going to be slightly lower. Is it going to be a drop and a precipitous drop? In my opinion, absolutely not in strong markets. Um, however, you know, you, you will be, I think you will see um, winners and losers dictated by economies of scale. Um, and I think you'll see larger companies thrive and continue to do well and, and gobble up assets. But I think the folks that were going to be hurt by this whole pandemic and the unemployment and depending on the length of the recession are the mom and pop owners where they're just going to be squeezed and can't hold on to a certain property or something like that. So I don't think it's going to be systematic. Uh, but I think there will be places and opportunities, even in strong markets, where you can find uh, potentially opportunities to invest in, in good assets, good locations, just because uh, of being opportunistic and having your finger on the trigger. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, we have a question. Are tertiary markets being considered by lenders? Of course they are. Obviously, the loan terms change. You know, they're a lot stricter. Why don't you guys talk a little bit about that? Because we... You know, when we invest in Tucson, obviously our uh, loan to value is less, maybe the rate's a little higher, but uh, you guys can speak to that, please. Sure, um, I'll, actually, Andrew, I'll let you be the first one for, to answer this one. Sure, um, yeah, I, so the short answer is yes. Um, it, post COVID, I think there's just more scrutiny on smaller markets in general. Um, you know, I can speak from the agency side though, Freddie is mission driven to put uh, debt out to support affordable housing nationwide in every community. And so uh, depending on how they're feeling, if they're feeling mission critical, we see them be more aggressive in smaller markets. And if they're uh, not so much feeling it, sometimes they pull back, but in general, it's available. But what we see is they actually rank their markets. Um, and then as a servicer and originator on their behalf, we also rank the markets. And Freddie has an interesting way of doing it. They call it sort of a top market, um, a standard market, and then a, a, a low or small market. And so depending on the ranking of the market, it will dictate how aggressive they will be in their loan terms. Um, Fannie does the same thing. They just don't really advertise it. Um, and again, it, it's the same mechanism. As you move out away from more primary markets into more rural communities, you'll find that your loan to values effectively go down um, and your debt service coverage ratios effectively go up, meaning that if you're acquiring property in tertiary markets, you will need to bring more equity to the table. The good part is the prices should be cheaper than in the primary markets. And so hopefully you know, you'll be able to buy you know, property twice as large in a tertiary market as you do in a primary market. And then, uh, okay. So, um, and then I think the other kind of thing is uh, for tertiary markets, um, it's important to kind of consider other lenders, right? Because if for very core kind of product, right? At the at least at the moment, um, I think that obviously this changes. I mean, if if you look back, you know, six six months ago, or I mean, eighteen months ago, for example, right? Fannie and Freddie was not um, in the core in the core markets wasn't as competitive. Um, as you know, life insurance, and I think they were starting to lose out CMBS as well, um, just because they um, they filled up their book a little too quickly for the year, right? So they had to kind of pull back a little bit. But um, so I mean, the the ant, I mean, kind of the the markets are pretty fluid in general. But um, yeah, for tertiary markets, the benefit there is you have better cash flow, right? So um, LTV does start playing uh, more of a role than debt service coverage ratio con uh, constraints. 
um, just because you're getting that sl slightly higher cap rate. So, and because of that, um, yeah, I think, uh, for example, um, you know, we have a couple of life insurance companies. That's a lot of what they do is just uh, make uh, multifamily loans in tertiary markets um, and they do really well. So. And Andy, you mentioned, you know, uh, Freddie wants to do a lot of affordable housing. So do they still have the waiver there for affordable housing and what, what's the qualifier for that? So they both, both Fannie and Freddie have uh, pricing discounts based on affordability. Uh, they price deals um, and, and the, wa the waiver is a, a sliding scale and it depends on the percentage of the asset whose tenants fall below uh, 80%, 60%, et cetera, of um, uh, AMI, which is the average median income for where the asset is. And so absolutely. Uh, what we saw in the last few years was they also had a green initiative where if you were buying a property and installing low flow toilets and um, light, light fixtures that are LED, you could also get a discount. And they basically eliminated that. And so really the only way for to gain pricing discounts, so to speak, would be to buy more in more affordable areas in places that um, are serving affluent areas, but offering lower rents for the, compared to the market. Yeah, our, our last two loans, we did the green uh, program, and then we also got an affordability waiver as well, um, uh, which, which was great, you know, really brought down our rate. Um, what other questions? Because we're right, winding down here before we go into the uh, breakout room. So if you guys have a question, put it out there right now. Yeah, it looks like we have a couple more. So one of them uh, might be outside the scope of this discussion, but um, where do you go to find five plus unit buildings other than LoopNet and City Feet? <laughs> you, you guys probably know better than we do, but I would say local brokers. They are your best friends and especially the ones that are, you know, I think of Matthews here in Los Angeles. I think of Buckingham Investments here in LA. Um, you know, it's, it's the folks that are, I mean, these guys are pounding the pavement. They are literally knocking on doors of people that own apartment buildings saying, do you want to sell at a five cap? Because I can give that to you. And they're getting calls back. And those are the people that you should be hounding uh, to get deals because hopefully um, they have a couple in their pocket. Yeah, definitely brokers are on these uh, on these small websites. You're you're gonna get you know secondhand. It's it's already out there for a while, so you're not really finding deals. You're you're finding potentially you're finding opportunities that because there's something wrong, and so sometimes those, those are the best deals to get. It's something that's been sitting for a while, and so maybe there's there's room for negotiation, and you you're able to fix that problem. But but you've you've got to have those broker relationships. Um, then we have one more question here from Luke. What's the most common question or questions you've been getting from investors as of late? <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of these, uh, I mean, a lot of the questions we got, we've been receiving have been pretty general. Um, you know, they've been kind of what's going on, you know, it's, and I think that's, that's the most important kind of question that, you know, to ask is just because, you know, I think a lot of, I mean, for example, a month ago, yeah, CNBS was out. Now CNBS is going deals, right? Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of life com companies are in uh, now that weren't in there before, um, you know, the reserve requirements change all the time, right? So I think that's, there's a lot of the questions we've, we've been asked have been just kind of very general um, less so specific, but, um, that actually does bring me up to a good point. I recently did a piece about a couple of weeks ago, uh, where I discussed kind of the, uh, the state of the general lending market, uh, where I discussed kind of where different lenders are, um, and kind of what challenges and what kind of considerations that they're facing. Um, so I, I'll be happy to, um, you know, kind of dis distribute that if, if anyone's interested in reading. Yeah, I'd say um, the, the, the big questions I get are, um, can, can I still buy a place today? Can I, can I do an acquisition and feel confident? And I'd say absolutely from the debt side, um, yes, but there are maybe uh, additional restrictions or reserves that need to be underwritten into your business plan. Uh, and also maybe 
with a caveat to that is make sure that you're negotiating your PSA and putting in additional extensions because things are taking longer, inspections are delayed, uh, it's hard to get in to see properties. So that's, that's been a big one for us. And the other question is, can I take cash out of my property? Um, because you know, a lot of even banks just sort of stopped lending for a little bit. And so I think local relationships, when they called their banker uh, and they said, you know, I'm sorry, but we're just kind of on hold for the time being, it, it created a little bit of panic. Uh, but the answer is absolutely. Um, you can still do cash out refinances um, and put some money back in your pocket today. Those are probably the two biggest. Nice. Robbie, any other questions? I see there's one question there um, from Brian Moss. I have been, uh, I have seen properties of stabilized physical vacancies, but high economic vacancies. Um, how, how do we handle this? How do lenders see this? Uh, for, and to answer that, uh, it's effectively, uh, they look at it as a core plus or bridge transaction uh, for the most part. Um, so, yeah, but more on the safer side, right? Because uh, the cash flow is there. And there's, there's no big gaps there. Um, so you, you know, they get slightly better terms for that, but, um, but there's different ways to solve the problems, right? I mean, one way, um, you know, one, one lender I've been talking to recently, uh, they'll, they have been doing a lot of earnouts where they do, um, they'll fund, uh, some, up to 75%, 120 debt service coverage ratio, um, on the acquisition. And then, uh, within the time period, usually a year or two, uh, it's usually set what they'll do is they will uh, have um, kind of levels, thresholds for, uh, for the bar to hit. Um, and if those thresholds are hit, what they'll do is they'll earn you out um, the, the amount of money <laughs> that, that uh, has been pre-negotiated up front. So, um, so, that, so that's one way to kind of solve that problem. Yeah, Mike, that's exactly right. And what I, what I think this question might be referring to probably relates to local county and state ordinances, possibly with uh, rent control, because uh, it's pretty rare to see, you know, if you filled up an entire place, um, but you have high economic vacancy, it's probably because you have below market rents. Um, and so part of it will be understanding what that property is. And there are folks out there that we work with and, and Mike as well, who will do an earn out type structure or potentially depending on uh, their knowledge of the local county and state regulations uh, will give you credit for uh, rent bumps that you can take over the next three years and fund the loan today on that to give you more proceeds today. Uh, one thing I will say just specifically to the agencies, which is unlike other lending um, uh, outlets is Fannie and Freddie both require what we call 90 for 90 before they will fund the loan. That's 90% occupancy for 90 days. And by occupancy, they require a tenant to have a signed lease paying rent and have moved in and provide evidence of move in. And so um, for the agencies, I don't think this would be the type of deal that they could get their heads around unless it was a floating rate value add type deal. But on the permanent side, you'd have to see that stabilization for at least three months prior to funding your loan. All right, great. Well, uh, I hope everyone learned, learned a ton today. Thank you, Mike and Andrew for coming on.